how the trip begins. We're heading off to the San Juan Islands this weekend and there are a lot of fires between us and the island. But we got the airplane loaded up. Uh, we got one plane that's already running and everybody else is just sort of converging on the island tomorrow morning. So this is kind of fly up, get everything ready, and then uh, meet the gang. We have 43 people coming to the island. I'm Jason Miller, a full-time professional flight instructor. On the Finer Points channel, you can join me as I bring you tips and tricks that I've learned from 20 years on the flight line. In principle, all of the adventure trips are the same. A six-year-old boy took a look at it once and said, I get it. It's airplane camp for adults. We bring pilots out to the environment we're teaching them about, do some ground school around the campfire, a whole bunch of flying and contingency planning in the event something goes wrong. We want our pilots to be prepared. In the golden tree, I think we found the perfect classroom. The trip is all inclusive, so we take care of everything. Oh, yeah, baby. And on the island trip, day one is about ground school. On day two, we cross the border into Canada with the help of Canadian air traffic control. It's awesome to have Ryan Van Haren with us on the ground to help manage this. Okay, so if you're gonna cross the international boundary, Day three is all about contingency planning. We do a life raft deployment, signal mirrors, fire starting. Everybody gets stick time in a seaplane so that we can see what a ditching actually feels like. It's way too much to cover in one video, so this is part one of a three-part series. And here, you're gonna meet some of the instructors you'd spend the weekend with. I worked as a river guide for 100 years before I got into medicine. This is Dr. Howard Donner. He's really my partner in these trips. We conceive of them together and we've been executing them together for as long as the Finer Points has been running them. When Howard's not out with us on these trips, he's leading expeditions all over the world from Turkey to Fiji to Mount Everest, uh, climbing trips, sailing trips, river trips. He's really an extraordinary person. He's a CFI, the co-author to the Field Guide on Wilderness Medicine, and a commercial pilot and one of the best teachers I know. And, you know, we usually avoided any kind of a folding knife because, you know, you're trapped under a raft, whatever's going on, you need to use it quickly. You know, one could describe getting caught in your seatbelt in an inverted helicopter underwater. You know, it's hard to take a folding knife. You've got one hand and you're trying to open it. So typically survival knives work well. You saw what Eric's looked like. He's talking about Eric Cope. Eric started as an army helicopter pilot and then spent a career flying for Hawaiian Airlines. He currently owns a Cessna 180 and flies all over California. Eric is a big proponent of a survival vest and talks us through what's in his and why. If you didn't have this, they wouldn't lay in the airplane. And to this day, I can't climb in my 180 without this thing on. It just doesn't feel right. Just a lot of like the military radios, I can't have those anymore, but I've replaced it with a spot transmitter up here. Uh, got two uh, of those uh, survival sleeping bags in here from my wife and I. I've got a uh, water pouch, water purification tablets, a strobe that floats if you go in on the water. Um, K-bar knife, you can get these off eBay. It's just a marine issue knife, which is super heavy duty. It has basically a hammer on the top for breaking up bones and things like that. Uh, matches, parachute cord, one of the best things ever is parachute cord. You just could use it for shelter, tie your knife to a stick and make a spear, just all sorts of things you can do with parachute cord. Sometimes I look around at these guys and I think how lucky I am to be able to bring all of these amazing aviators together in one place. And I think one of the crown jewels of our group is Peter Lurt. Um, I don't even know where to start with Peter. He's a former Burt Rutan test pilot, former editor of Air Progress magazine. He's Got every flight instructor rating you can think of from balloons to gliders to fixed wing airplanes. There's pretty much nothing Peter hasn't done. He's got over 50 North Atlantic crossings, and that was before GPS. So it's always great to hear what Peter has to say about flying. 
I can't go in depth on each one of these guys in this video. You're going to hear more from each one of them in the subsequent two videos. Uh, but I was very happy that Flight Chops and his crew were able to join us on this trip to isolate Peter and go a little deeper on some of his flying experiences. You know, Bert was so creative. He did so many wonderful things on his own. For example, when he wanted to get wind tunnel data on the Very Easy, he had left his reasonably paying job at um, first at the Air Force and then at Beatty to strike out on his own and he couldn't afford to hire any wind tunnel time plus it was generally not available so he built a free field wind tunnel he had a a 10-foot pylon on top of a particularly objectionable dodge dart station wagon and it was instrumented just like the pylon would be in a wind tunnel and he had a model very easy up there and early in the morning when the air over the desert in mojave was still he and Carolyn would be bombing along the highway at 90 miles an hour with Carolyn driving and him in the right seat, reading off the instrumentation on the wind tunnel. I think they were fairly well known to the highway patrol by then. It was a wonderful little airplane, again, one that I regretted its destruction, the Marchetti SF-260, which is a little Italian military two-seat trainer, actually based originally on a little wooden two-seat airplane called the Falco, many of which were later built as kits. Although, as a wonderful wooden airplane, you pretty much had to be Stradivarius to build one properly. And um, this particular one, they're so desirable that people will go to any length to get one. In this case, someone in Alabama bought one in New Zealand and decided he'd rather have it flown home than have it shipped. And this was in 1988 and Russia was still the Soviet Union, so I couldn't go around the Pacific, and it was too small an airplane to put fuel in to get across the big stretches of water. So I had to come around the other way, Australia, Indonesia, India, Europe, and so forth. And I was two days out from delivering the airplane at a place called Narsarsuak in southern Greenland. I don't know if you ever read the classic aviation novel, um, or history really, called Fate is the Hunter. It's by Ernie Gann who lived in Friday Harbor, by the way. Okay. And what he describes as Bluey West One in Greenland is Narsarsuak. Interesting airport, it's at sea level at the end of a fjord 60 miles in from the, from the open ocean. And a flawless VFR morning, and I had just taken off to go over to Canada, and at about a thousand feet, it threw a rod. So it was sort of game over, and I had to pick the least worst place to park it. And that's what I did. Again, you know, the thoughts that went through my mind, I thought, can I limp back to the airport? And when I came around the corner of the fjord where the airport could see me again, they said it appeared to be on fire because of all the smoke coming out of the oil on the engine. And at that point is when I decided it's not mine, it's insured, I'll park it somewhere. And have the crash go. Fine, I'm here. Yeah. Um, the airplane was substantially damaged. Prob you know, I wouldn't say it was totaled in the sense that um, Marchetti's are so desirable that I've seen rebuild projects commence with not much more than the data plate and a logbook and a checkbook. Um, actually, we discussed the fuselage was untouched. The propeller was even untouched because I stopped it and it stopped straight across. The engine was junk before I landed, of course. The wings and main landing gear and nose gear were damaged, but if they had elected to buy a set of wings and landing gear and a new engine mount and an engine from the manufacturer, we probably could have flown it out in a couple of weeks. But that wasn't the case? Um, I don't know exactly what happened to it. I rented a helicopter the next day and we took the airplane back to the, um, to the airport and I hitched a ride out of there and went home. And I'm not really sure what became of the airplane after that. It was unfortunate. I'd flown it all that way. I was only two days out. So that's pretty amazing stuff. We get to spend the entire weekend with these guys. So when they're not lecturing, you have a chance to kind of just sit around and talk to him the way Steve was talking to Peter there. Um, I'm going to do another video on border crossings where we go a little deeper with Ryan, also on uh, life raft deployment and, and survival training so we can go a little bit deeper with Howard. But if you have the opportunity to join us this summer or next summer or for as long as we're running these, um, like I said, I'm just so proud that I can bring all these people together in one spot 
and I wanted to make this video so that you can kind of see a little bit about what we're doing up there each August in the San Juan Islands. It was more interesting in the BD-5, which being young and immortal and not knowing any better, I spun it in, on purpose on my first flight in it. It spun very rapidly, of course. And then it hit some bumpy air and it had float carburetors, and in fact, it did quit on my first flight in it. But I was near the airport and I came back and landed. What else would one do? Yeah. 